one eye. And so when I would get up at night to go to the bathroom or something, you'd see this like one eye glowing because the other eye was gone. And, I mean, it's like, let's give them one, one glowing eye, you know? And let's maybe tie it to, you know, I think we decided to tie it to his luck power and have it be that, you know, every time he used his power, there was like some repercussion. And, but I mean, basically, it was it was this the best thing you can ever hope for with an artist is this just back and forth and back and forth and you know working together on something. So that's the long shot story. I think that I've always assumed that a lot of the media parody in long shot was your idea, though. Okay. Delicose Mojo yeah. was like this parody, this nightmare parody of a Hollywood producer, yes. and a leading lady with a stunt woman. Yeah, no, that stuff all came from, I was reading uh, media theorists, like, I was in some stupid college class at the time, and they had me reading Chomsky and Marshall McLuhan and all these, like, amazing, there was somebody's idea was, I think it was Chomsky, manufacturing consent, which, yeah. like, and, you know, so, and I was reading about how the media was, like, gobbling up, all the big media was gobbling up the little media, and they were fighting for your attention. The whole, and this was way, uh, this was pre-internet. So the idea of like this captive audience, like we've got you here right now. You know, so a lot of Mojoverse came out of like that kind of media theory thinking, which, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, God, that must have been so boring. Yeah. But, you know, like, you know, you, you can't really, you can't overload a comic with too many ideas. But, I mean, Arthur and I were just maniacs. I mean, it was like the art was detailed, there were many, many panels, there were tons of ideas. We just kind of went uh, crazy together, you know? Uh, we had a Spider-Man event of the 80s, it was a black costume, which eventually was going to be doing that. How long this hold on? Uh, I think... A fan actually uh, sent in the idea for the black costume, and Jim Shooter liked it uh, and worked out some deal. They paid him, and you know, uh, and it wasn't exactly how the costume wound up looking in the comic. I think then either Mike Zach or uh, Rick Leonardi designed the actual black costume. I think it was I think it was Zach, and they debuted it. They wanted to have. Uh, this major crossover comic, uh, Secret Wars, and they wanted to have big events. You know, like instead of having a crossover where at the end of the crossover everything's back to status quo, they wanted to have well at the end of this, you know, they come back and, and nothing is the same. And in Spider-Man's case, it was, you know, he got uh, this living costume, and it was, no, it was not at first. Not at first and you know the alien costume um and i think it made for you know after the, 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 there was this weird thing that i i, I sometimes observe because uh, now i'm the editor at, at, at uh, paper cuts and we do you know all ages comics and whenever anyone hears the phrase all ages they think well that's for little kids but you know i look at it as literally for all ages uh, and but kids are very weird when they're reading stuff. And one of the things Marvel had done, uh, I think in, uh, in the 80s with Spider-Man, to help get it you know, out there and more popular, was team up with the electric company, the, the Children's Television Workshop, and they created uh, a sequence on the show where Spider-Man would appear and, and word you know, word balloons would appear over his head, and I, you know, kid, you know, help kids learn how to read. And Marvel published Spidey Super Stories, which I wrote for many years. And I think the way kids are is that, you know, when, you, when you're an adult, every 10 years is like one year of being a kid. You know, like you're, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. But when you're a kid, there's a big difference between being five and going to six, and then six to seven. It's like, it's colossal. And if a kid was reading Spidey Super Stories and had the red and blue costume in it, and then they were reading the Amazing Spider-Man comics, and he's still wearing that red and blue costume, there are some kids out there who would like see their friends reading and think, oh, you're still reading like that Spider-Man? 
when the black costume came along, or the, and it certainly wasn't in, you know, intended for this, but what it did is it gave this generation of kids, no, this is not that silly Spidey Super Story Spider-Man. This is the new cool Spider-Man. He has a black costume. And it really had a big impact. And again, it's like, you know, for so many years, you know, Spider-Man was this thing. And then right before their eyes, he's changed. He has a different costume. But unfortunately, where I came in, I'm this <laughs> sort of dinosaur. And uh, when I looked at this black costume, I, I was just like these old cranky fans would go, that's not my Spider-Man. And I just, and the reasons I, I didn't like it, I thought it was a well-designed costume, but I thought, it looks like a villain. And in the 80s, specifically in 1986, that's when everything in comics changed. Yes. And things got darker. You know, there was the I Dark Knight. Book about this. And there was the Watchmen. And, you know, Daredevil was you know, the days of Mike Murdoch or a distant memory and, and Daredevil is dark and it's really scary, bloody, awful things happening in it. And because it's succeeding and the audience is liking it, there's a whole lot of people who are liking, and even the editors and, and writers and all the creative people like, you know, no one wants their book to not sell incredibly well. They all want to be, you know, have something that's successful. And they, they, I think they saw this as an opportunity where, where Spider-Man could be darker, literally, and have a black costume, and, and maybe the story could be darker. And I think I, I even uh, wound up editing one of the uh, some of the darker Spider-Man stories, like the Craven the last, last, Hunt. last Hunt, which is about as dark as you can get with Spider-Man. Was it ever? One thing I've always wondered was, at any point, it was the black costume be a permanent change or was it always intended to be temporary? And was the costume always conceived of as being a living entity? That I, I honestly don't know. I, I, I know that they got rid of the, the living entity and he was just literally wearing a costume. And when I took over the Spider-Man titles, my thinking was I'd like to get back to you know, Red and Blue. And my boss was Jim Shooter, who was the main, you know, person behind, you know, you know, bringing the black and white costume. So if he had intended, or if the, I think he probably intended the black and white costume to go a lot longer. But when I approached him and said, you know, would it be okay if I go back to the red and blue? Uh, I don't think he wanted to, you know, be labeled as someone who was stifling creativity in any way so and I guess he figured he could always go back to you know, the black and white if he wanted to but he, he said okay I mean one of the other things that was oddly happening during the 80s is a lot of Marvel's top people uh, would sort of rise to a certain level like Frank Miller for example and even though they were you know, given lots of great opportunities by Jim Shooter. At some point, it's almost like these were artists coming of age in a sense. It's like just like um, when you're a child and you have a parent, and then you become a teenager and you go through a process where now you have to rebel and you want to, you know, reject, you know, the, and and that sort of manifested itself in a lot of Marvel's top talent during the 80s deciding, okay, I'm done with Marvel. I'm going to get a better deal at DC. Yeah, and uh, and one of the reasons I think Todd McFarlane is such a clever guy, uh, during the 80s, there, so, there, there really was sort of a lot of people thinking, okay, I, you know, I, I, I did something uh, that got a lot of attention at Marvel, but now I'm going to go over to DC. They've been knocking at my door, and they're going to get a better deal. Ultimately, the yeah, well, a little bit later, but at, at this point, and, and, and it was the same thinking. I think Todd McFarlane had, uh, had been doing some work at DC Comics, and he sees all these big names from Marvel coming to DC. He figures, I'm going to go up, you know, visit Marvel. And he brought his portfolio, and one of the books he had, he had done uh, 
I mean, everyone remembers uh, it was uh, Miller and Mazzucchelli who did Batman in year one, right? And, uh, but who remembers Batman in year two, which, uh, uh, I saw. Well, and, and, and Todd had done the pencils on it, and Todd was very much inspired by a lot of artists such as Art Adams and uh, Walt Simonson and John Byrne, and uh, was, was going for a very specific look. You know, he was trying to be part of that kind of very detailed uh, look that these guys, which was very popular at the time, but they gave uh, his pencils to a well-established, very talented anchor, uh, Alfredo Alcala. And, but he was of the, like, like sort of old-school uh, anchor in a sense. Five minutes? Oh, okay. I, was, I, was, the guy I, was, I was told earlier that that's... Yes, you can. I'm just, just, go just giving you four oh, okay. Can we go to uh, questions now? Oh, I've okay. got one more question for you, okay. and then we're going to go Q&A. So, uh, I'll wrap it up real quickly. Uh, anyway. We got Todd, when Todd agreed to do Spider-Man, he said, I want to do the red and blue costume. So that was great. So, uh, I don't know, I can't do this quickly. Anyway, the editor, we decided we'll do it issue 300. Uh, Tom DeFalco was then the editor-in-chief. He says, what are you doing in issue 300? He said, uh, we said, we're going to go back to the red and blue costume. He says, that's not good enough. Come up with a major new villain. And I thought, well, what can we do? Uh, well, I always thought the black and white costume looked like a villain. We'll make that a villain. But think about it, you know, the editor-in-chief says, do this, there have been 300 issues. All the major villains were like, in the, you know, like Stanley, Steve Dicko, and John Romita. There hadn't been any in a long time. You know, your boss is telling you to do this. And thanks to Todd and David McElhinney, uh, then it did become a major new villain. The end. <laughs> what did you think of Frank Miller's Daredevil, and what was it like working with Daredevil yourself? From the other question. What? What? You want the question? Question. Question. What did you think of Frank Miller's Daredevil? What was it like working on Daredevil yourself? Oh, well, um, I lived in right there in New York, so my Daredevil was very influenced by the world that I was living in at the time, which was 80s Manhattan was not that safe a place. And it was, you know, it was kind of wild and, uh, you know, 42nd Street, Times Square, it didn't look at all like it does now. And um, so I, I drew right from my own life. Um, I don't know, I mean, I mean, I really liked what Frank did, but I was so new to the business, I didn't, I don't think I quite understood that I was like following something epic, which maybe is why I, they got me to do it. Maybe they asked everyone else and everyone else said no. <laughs> well, I think it was brilliant, actually, because uh, everyone else was too intimidated and they would have just been trying to imitate, whereas I think it was a smart choice that you were someone, as you said, you know, like with the long shot, just bursting with creativity. And, you know, so there are lots of people, uh, I still hear at conventions, uh, you know, uh, if they, I, I think they hold your daredevil for the second, you know. Well, you know what's weird right? is that I think um, I had a problem with the violence, actually. The, the, fact, the fact that um, in comics, because I was fairly new to comics and I didn't grow up reading them, and I, but I was a big reader and a, you know, you know, all the stories have to escalate into some kind of a fisticuff thing. And in my life in general, you kind of find more peaceful ways to get over conflicts. Oh, so, yeah. you, you know, so it was kind of like, Daredevil is supposed to be this, you know, incredibly, you know, compassionate, empathic character. And it, at first I had a problem having everything escalate into fights. So I think that a lot of my stories, although my stories were certainly violent, and I did, and I was studying martial arts at the time, so I loved choreographing fights. I mean, choreographing fights can be really fun if you are actually, you know, sparring yourself. And um, But I, I ended up doing a lot of stories where I was like, let me figure out some way to make the violence a little harder to get to or to have some kind of, and you know, there was this one point when it was, he was battling, um, 
bullet, I think it was. And, and I thought, well, let me have the fight crash right through a peace rally. Because, you know, and I don't mention, mention it other than that there's maybe like, make love, not war. You know, signs in the background. You know, Johnny, uh, JR and I would talk. You know, we'd come up with these ideas and he would, you know, follow through on that stuff. But basically, I think it was a lot of my stories were, I was always grappling with how the hell do I make things always escalate into a conflict, you know, which is a weird thing to say about comic books, you know, super, superhero comic books. But yeah, so no, I had a great time and I, I was too stupid to be intimidated by following Frank Miller. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, was there a real rivalry with DC in the 80s, especially when DC started hiring away some of the writers? Well, DC means Detective Comics, right? right? And we used to call them the Distinguished Competition or yeah. something. I mean, we had nicknames for them. And Brand honestly, I had a feeling that... Um, the the Dull Mar Competition. The what? The Dull Competition. The dull, <laughs> Marvel always, I think, felt superior, or that is just the feeling at the office where, like, we don't really worry about them, yeah. you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, along those lines, when I was editing Spider-Man, uh, you know, whatever competitive nature I had, you know, there was nothing at DC that, you know, sold better than Spider-Man, so I, I, I couldn't compete with that, so the thing I had to compete with was at Marvel, I had to, you know, I'm going to go up against X-Men. Yeah. And uh, I suspect that DC felt more competitive because, as Jim said, they managed to lure away a lot of Marvel's top talent. But what I think of when I think of the 80s and Marvel and DC is how much socializing there was, how much community between DC and Marvel people uh, outside of work during that period, where on Friday nights a bunch of Marvel and DC people would like, get together and take over a whole floor of a restaurant for dinner. And that sort of thing stopped happening in the 90s. Um, yes, you. Yeah, uh, I was born in the late 80s, so I became acquainted with the 80s storylines through the Marvel Essential books, you know, the reprints. And I was wondering, you mentioned the Dark Phoenix saga a few times, and that's a great saga. But my particular favorite saga involving the X-Men in the 80s came at the, late, at the end of the 80s, and that was the fall of mutants. We finally got to see Apocalypse, and we got to see all that nasty stuff happen with Angel. Were you still involved with X-Men at that point? And what did you think of that whole story? I mean, I think I was the editor, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean I remember it. No, the, uh, the idea, you know, I'm, I'm, like Peter was saying, um, you go out to lunch with Chris Claremont, and this was the training we got from the Louise Simonson. She was Louise Jones back then, but we called her Wheezy. She had three names. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Chris would just start talking, and he would have these notepads, and I, you know, I, he would he would just start writing things, and uh, me or me and Peter, and before, and after you, I think it was Terry Cavanaugh, or yeah. before you. Um, and you would just shoot ideas at him, and I think it was almost like Chris just kept talking and talking and talking. And you'd sit there, and when you perked up, when you perked up at an idea and gave him some feedback, the idea just got bigger and bigger. So I don't actually remember whose idea it was, maybe Peter remembers, but the idea was also at the time was was maybe one of the first times that we decided to see if other people in the Marvel Universe wanted to play. Like, did other books want to play? Even if it was, there's this big battle going on in the sky, and in the Spider-Man books, if you wanted to, you could have someone look up and see something. So it could be really, really minor, or it could be an actual crossover, but it was the, uh, the excitement of the shared universe. So I can't, I think, you know, I participated as a writer in Daredevil. I don't really remember who else played in that big game, but... Well, I mean, there, that happened a couple of times, I remember, in the 80s. Whereas now you have, you know, Marvel and DC, they have their editorial retreats with major writers, and they plan out what's going to happen in the next two years, and you have all these universe-wide events. But back then, for example, when Walt Simonson 
introduced a casket of ancient winters. And Thor, Chris said, oh, I want to do something with that. And other people did too, because they were friends and they saw each other and they talked and they thought this would be a fun thing to do. Or like the people uh, who we were just talking about, you had the Wheaton massacre in 1986 yeah, when the warlocks were being slaughtered by the marauders. And Walt did a story about that and Louise did a story about that. And again, it's because they were all buddies and they wanted to have a good time working together. And that's another big change from back then to the corporate comics of today. I think that's what led into Secret Wars, wasn't it? The, because the crossovers well, so, were popular? Well, Secret Wars was came about, as I understand it, because Marvel had this deal going to do a, to do a toy line of comics, oh, yeah, yeah, and they yeah, wanted yeah. to have a comic book to support that. But that was sort of the beginning of the what Peter Gillis calls the top-down storytelling, where the person who, who's in charge decrees that everybody's got to do stories to tie into this big event. And that's very different from people getting together over lunch yeah, and yeah, saying, let's give a mute from NASA. Although it still, it still happens out over in D.C. when I took over Catwoman, the, you know, Scott Snyder sent around a, like, one sheet that was basically that was a top-down story idea, but his one sheet was very, very elegant. It was very like, this is what's going to happen in Batman with the Joker, and if you want to play in this playground, and uh, you know, and it was something that everyone got excited about. We all wanted to do it, and he gave he gave like a tiny thing, you know, that the Joker will be torturing and taunting Catwoman because he wants to find out how what is her relationship with Batman. And so it was really, really a beautifully, elegantly done thing, whereas sometimes, you know, the, somebody will give you a, you know, say, can you play in this playground? We're doing this thing called Gothtopia. Can you play? You know, okay, yeah, I'll play. But then you don't really get it something quite as, I think in that case, it was the Scarecrow was the villain. And then suddenly they took the scarecrow out of all the books that were playing in that playground and you were kind of left villainless. You know. So sometimes they're they're really beautifully orchestrated and sometimes not so well orchestrated. And I think there's a difference between do would you like to play with this and you must hide. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a lot of examples with Secret Wars too that I remember because everybody had to tie in whether they want to or not. But no matter what, it's their own books, not to do it. Yeah. Um, Questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the Batman Beyond series. Mm -hmm. You. You, in green. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, Marvel did a lot of toy tie ins in the 80s, and I was curious how those came about. They had Micronauts, ROM, G.I. Joe. Did the toy companies come to Marvel, or did Marvel say, hey, this is a pretty cool toy, we'd like to build you know, something around this? I think that, well, I know in the case of Micronauts, it's because Bill Mantlo, uh, was it that he had a son who really liked the Micronauts toys and then all went to Marvel and said, let's do a book about them? I'll say yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't really remember. I know that I had Ron, Micronauts, and Star Wars. And, um, you know, uh, Bill Mantlo, I think, was the writer on Rom and Micronauts. And he just, yes. he did such a beautiful job. I mean, he just did a really terrific job. I don't know, it's hard to describe, but some books just came easy because the the team was think that doesn't really happen that much anymore where you keep a team consistent for years well I thought that was essential I mean when you talk about Chris uh, the writers if they're doing a really good job uh, they're in a sense the voice of the characters and, you know the characters are reflecting different sides of the writer and when you have uh, you know different writers every issue or you know it's, it's then it just it's everyone sort of writing what they think the editors want and it's, and it's less of themselves so you know it's up to people to decide what they like i just wanted to say what's in the case of star wars this is sort of you know a bit of lost history in that uh, uh, you know, George Lucas, when he was putting the film together, had no idea, you know, if anyone would ever go see it. And in many ways, I've always argued for years that and it's almost forgotten now, but the Star Wars comic was launched six months 
before the movie was released. Not and, that no, no, it was. No, well, it was okay. Well, I don't know, but anyway, it was pretty far out ahead of the uh, the movie. And to a large, you know, because when people they do the histories of Star Wars, they say why did finally often there were lines around the block. Well, you know, of course, partly it was you know they were actively promoting it at conventions. They were you know you know going to everything they could to promote this thing. But lines around the block, in many ways, I felt Star Wars was almost like the first Marvel comics movie. There was the comic, there were all these fans buying it, because the comic started was a hit with the very first issue. Sure, I love that opening day is the only way because I didn't even know. Who's the first writer on that? Uh, Roy Tide. Oh. Roy oh. was actually one of the first. I have the team of uh, Mary Jo Duffy, Joe Duffy. That was years and years later. Yeah, she was so good. I mean, she just, she knew the universe so well, and the only thing I didn't have to do, I used to have to send the plots to Lucasfilms, and they pretty much were fine with everything until she hit on, I think it was almost like the Death Star or something. No, she, the Ewoks, she came up with something like the Ewoks she, before they did the Did that, the and then there was also something kind of like the Death Star, like, and then there was also the early years of the Jedi training school thing. I mean, she had so many good ideas. And when Lucasfilm would send a letter and reject an idea, you'd always be like, are they just taking Joe Duffy's idea? Or is it that simultaneity of both having the idea at the same time? There's also, between Roy Thomas and Howard Shaken doing the original adaptation of the movie, you also have this wonderful period with Archie Goodwin and Carmine Contino doing this series. Sure. Before he got Joe Duffy and Cindy Martin. Cindy Martin. Um, you mentioned at the beginning there's a lot of the change in the age. You have the direct market, you have the open-ended, long-running storylines that exist now with you know, X-Men and Daredevil and whatnot. Do, do you feel that in that, though, we lost the art of the ability for somebody to just walk in, like a youngster, and pick up a book and just start reading it from that point? I well, I can't. Yeah. More and more as time went by. Well, in my case, and you know, I, my reputation is Mr. Continuity. Uh, it's like, but I, it's been a long time since I've been on the 3D Marvel list. So I'm more of a casual reader. There's some books I get regularly, and some I just look into from time to time, and sometimes I will squat and I want that back. And it's like, and I know, you know, other long time Marvel pros who, are, yes, they have the same reaction. They try to stop reading the Marvel series, and they're confused because. One thing that was good, really good about Jim Shooter is he had this rule that every issue of a comic is somebody's first issue. And you've got to give them enough information at the beginning to get their bearings, to have some idea of what's going on. And he may have taken this too far and done too much exposition, but it was basically the right idea. That he should, whereas nowadays I think they expect that they're writing, you know, like these six story, eight story arcs because they've got the trade paperback in mind, and too often they don't bother to do anything resembling a recap in the in like issue three or issue four, and if you came into the middle, too bad. I think that's why Marvel didn't they start doing that one page thing that get, gets you up to speed, yeah. you know? But um, but, they, but they don't do it regularly. I haven't seen that. Yeah. One thing I really like about the Fable series of Vertigo is that when they do a great paperback, they do a two-page feature with pictures of all the major characters and short descriptions of who they are and what they're doing at that point in the plot. Yeah, this is one of the Fables. Oh, Fables. So, uh, the other thing is we used to have those, don't you guys remember that um, that short summary at the top? You know, yeah. like, for you, for I think so. Stan also, Lee presents. Yes, and then it was like, for Daredevil, it was like, hit by a radioactive isotope at, you know, da, da, da. so you could just read that little thing and at least, <laughs> But in a way, it could make you lazy because you really do want to establish the character, and that's part of the fun of comics: is what new, cool way can I establish Daredevil's, you know, heightened senses? Sure. I mean, I would love, I would like read Frank Miller stories and Marvel at at how subtly, but he would manage to sneak in all the expositions expository knowledge that we needed to have to follow the story, but he'd make it seem natural where other people were very heavy handed. We're getting the five fingers. 
Five finger discount. Oh, put it in one. Fifteen minutes after. Fifteen minutes after. So, if you want to do another five, that's fine. Oh, is that okay here? If, 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 if everyone wants to leave, yeah, then we'll stop. Leave, leave. <laughs> yeah, but anybody who has any more questions, we've got five minutes more. Uh, we were talking about a uh, random trade. Does that have that was my whole idea, yeah. Well, I mean, because particularly with Spider-Man, the continuity was, like, endless. And whenever they would try to do a trade paperback, which um, they would tell the editors, uh, you know, if you were doing X-Men or whatever group of books, you know, we'd like to have a trade paperback, you know, for this year or, or you know. And with Spider-Man, well, 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 gee, you know, this story began in uh, issue one, and now it's issue 223. It's, uh, <laughs> the trade paperback will be this big. So uh, I figured uh, when we launched a, a third, uh, a fourth Spider-Man title, uh, it was specifically, well, this could be the one that we can collect as trade. And that's why we did it. But just going back to that guy's question, the 60s at Marvel, one of the big innovations actually was the never-ending continued stories. I mean, it was only the very early years that Marvel had those complete stories, but what, what time do you think, what year do you think they shifted to almost everything was... Uh, six, well, it's, it's like, yeah. no, before 66, it's like maybe 64, 65, where, for example, in four, one issue would just go to the next, the next, the next, and without, without stop. You could stand on track and do a story that would last a year, and or when well, like uh, Fantastic Four, it's like the inhuman, originally inhuman story led directly into the Galactus and Silver Surface story. And so, but even so, I mean, the, they were always good about recaps and always good about the, So, I mean, and, and you too, when you were doing the uh, Spider-Man with Tom and Carla, you could come in in the middle of a story arc and still figure out what was going on. Yeah, well, I mean, but the trade paperbacks became this strange thing where you wanted the, if someone's just buying the trade and you read like say 20 pages into it and then for some reason you know the 21st, 2nd and 3rd pages are like telling you what just happened in the 20 pages you just read, it's like well I knew that happened and then you go another 20 pages and it's recapping again and it's like it, it just felt awkward whereas uh, you know what you're saying is right, but I think, you know, like it, it's just, you know, the form changing and trying to, you know, adapt to whatever, you know, is going on in the market today. I think that's, that's all the excuse they have now for not doing recaps, but again, I, I said that the better writers are able to do this without making it obvious. Right. I'm not disagreeing with that. So, uh, because when it is the sort of heavy handed mind, you know, my name is Spider-Man, I have, I can shoot webs on it, you know, if it's that bold and, and blatant, that's when it gets tiresome. Right. Uh, you. And what was the overall vibe in the